Our grace and peace to you from God the Father, from our Lord Jesus Christ. We gather together in God's presence, the one who is Father, Son and Spirit, an awesome, all-powerful God. And I really believe that God wants to meet with us tonight. It's such a, a wonder that the one who is uh, an all-powerful God knows our name. He knows our anxieties today. He knows our worries. He knows the burdens that we are carrying today. He knows our hearts, ultimately. If we fear God, well, we don't need to fear man. And we should come with an awe of God, a reverence for God today. You know, we may be sitting in our living rooms or in our studies or if the weather's good, maybe our, our garden. But today we come with an awe before a holy God to worship him. We come with humility, uh, we come with respect, but also we come knowing that we can just jump into his arms because he's father. He's Father. He's an amazing God. Yes, He's transcendent. He's above and beyond and all-powerful. But He's also imminent that He is our Father. We have a close, intimate relationship with God. He loves you and He's for you. Let me just read some words of Scripture as we gather for worship this morning. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. What great words from Hebrews chapter 10 that just encourage us to, to persevere, uh, particularly in the difficult times. And we have a great high priest, the Lord Jesus, who is praying for us, who is interceding for us now and presenting our prayers before the Father. And we are encouraged to hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess in Christ because God is faithful. We're encouraged to spur one another on, to encourage one another, to regularly commit to gathering together, whether that's online or in person, when we can and where we can. We are called to be a people who are faithful to the Lord. And he's faithful to us. He always keeps his promises. And I really believe God wants to bless today. God wants to speak today. God wants to minister today, um, wherever you are, as we worship the Lord together. Well, let me just pray um, as we prepare to sing a couple of songs of worship to the Lord. God, I just thank you that we can gather together in your presence today. I thank you, God, that you know our name that you know the number of hairs on our head, that we are so valuable to you. You know all our worries and our anxieties and our cares. And ultimately, God, you know our heart. You know where we are and where we stand before you. And we pray today that you would search our hearts, O oh God, that, Lord God, if there's any wicked way in us, that you would reveal it to us. And I thank you that the, the wonder of your grace and mercy means that you know, no matter how we fail, if we come in repentance before you with a genuine heart, that, Lord God, that you forgive us our sins and that, Lord God, that you lead us into all that you have. I thank you, Lord God, that your word makes it clear in First John that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins. I thank you for the grace of the Father. I thank you as we consider the story of the prodigal son again that that today we can revel in that grace, that none of us deserved a relationship with you. That very often, God, even when we know you, we wander from you. We follow the way of sin. But I thank you, you're always there, longing to see us come home. Help us to walk closely with you, Lord. Help us to, to stay near to you. And God, I pray that by your Spirit today in this service, that you would lead, that you would guide, that you would change lives, that you would set the captives free, that you would heal, that you would bless, 
that you would bring healing where there's brokenness. Jesus, there's power in your name and we rely on you. We need you. We need you, Jesus, to move in this service, to move in all the homes where people are gathering. We realize without you, we can do nothing. So Jesus, move. Jesus Christ in us, the hope of glory, move. One word from you, one touch from you. And transformation can take place. So Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come, we pray. Amen. Amen. Just encourage you, if you want to find out what's going on within the life of the church, to, to look at the bulletin and get a copy from the website if you've not had one emailed to you. And just encourage you to reflect on the, the questions that I send out, just for your own personal consideration. They can be really helpful, or I know one or two small groups use them um, as well. But uh, let's join together now in singing a couple of songs of worship and, and just praise the Lord. So let's sing.
church I believe in the resurrection When Jesus comes again For I believe in the name of Jesus I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son I believe in the Holy Spirit Our God is three in one I believe in the resurrection That He will rise again For I believe in the name of Jesus For I believe in the name of Jesus For I believe in the name of Jesus God loves you and has chosen you as his own special people. This is how God showed his love to us. He sent his one and only son into the world so that we could have life through him. No one has greater love than the one who gives their life for their friends. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us when we, while we were still sinners. God loved the people of this world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone who has faith in him will have eternal life and never really die. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous. It does not brag, and it is not proud. Love is not rude. It is not selfish, and it cannot be made angry easily. Love does not remember wrongs done against it. Love is never happy when others do wrong, but it is always happy with the truth. Love never gives up on people. It never stops trusting, never loses hope and never quits. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons. Neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. May you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and the power that comes from God. Before the world began, how wonderful to be. 
be a part of God's amazing plan. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. And He holds us in His hands. He holds us in His hands. And He holds us in His hands. And he holds us in his hands. And he holds us in his hands. Let's join together in prayer for our world, for our nation, for our church, for ourselves. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful that um, just as the passage from today says, you are a loving, forgiving, welcoming, compassionate Father, um, that you want to celebrate um, all that we are and all that we can be, that you want to welcome us back and take us in your arms and give us good things. I just pray that we would be willing to accept that, that we wouldn't be like the older son who hesitates in a mood outside of the door of the celebration um, and has to wait to be reminded that we are all welcome and that it's necessary to celebrate when uh, we return from walking away from you or when we have not noticed you working. And that, that helps us to think of our world today where things seem so desperate and are so desperate for so many people, yet you are working. Thank you, Lord, for stories of so many people released from slavery and persecution in in the terms of in terms of imprisonment during this time of p pandemic you have been working to liberate people you've been working in the lives of of those who who work to liberate people thank you for the work of international justice mission and many other organisations who seek to um, bring justice and wholeness to people's lives, um, to see those who perpetrate such horrific crimes against other human beings um, brought to justice. So Lord, we do pray that there would be justice. Lord, that there would be justice for people who experience war which is just beyond my comprehension and for many of us it's beyond our comprehension would you show compassion and allow people who are living through bombardment and loss of home and security would you let them know that you provide that security where people cannot would you provide security for those who have no food security? Lord, teach, teach us, teach those who have the skills to um, know how to equip people um, in techniques in farming that will help where there is drought, um, to, to be able to figure out how to irrigate where there is little water. Just please, Father, bring restoration to people's lives and livelihoods. Where it seems impossible, we know that it is possible with you. And we, we believe that also for people who've been displaced by climate chaos and food poverty, by loss of home through nat natural disaster or war, 
um, as they move away from their own place and become refugees we pray that there would be places of safety for them to go where there would be everything that they need not just physically but emotionally and spiritually that that you would provide for them through through your people and through people of goodwill lord would you give us compassion and teach us to pray for these and many other complicated situations in your world lord in our nation of the united kingdom we pray for peace we pray for peace between peoples of different perspectives um, different political views different religious views different societal views we pray for understanding and compassion among us we pray for wisdom for our elected members of parliament um, which would you give them the grace and the courage to do their job well um, to hold our government to account even in this time of pandemic we trust you that you can do that that you're working in our parliament we we do pray for our prime minister and the cabinet that they would know how best to respond um, in a way that is um, understanding of the the extreme complexity of of how this pandemic and the policies that have been put into place in the last seven months are affecting people's lives and we pray particularly for the economic impact on individuals and and businesses and on our nation as a whole we ask that you would intervene where possible and it is possible because you are God in Scotland we we pray for Nicola Sturgeon and the Scottish Government and uh, we thank you that there's been um, another announcement this week with clarity um, of of what will be happening for the next um, two to three weeks but again we ask Lord that you would um, make provision and that the government would make provision for those who are in economic hardship for businesses that are um, at risk um, but we pray that that we as as Christians as local churches um, as pe people who want to bless our communities that we would um, remember where we're anxious about the situation that we would remember that we have been sealed with promised Holy Spirit until the day of salvation and ultimately there is nothing to fear because you are in control we do thank you Father that you are in control and just finally Lord um, I just pray for for our schools for for the par um, for the parents for the teachers for the children as they are starting their holidays here in Fife um, would it would it be a restful peaceful um, restoring fortnight for all um, please take away all anxiety and fear for what might or might not happen in the next months um, I pray that for all of us that whether we're worried about our physical health or we're anxious or feeling isolated or frustrated that we would remember to look up to look to you and to remember the things that there are to celebrate that ultimately our future is sealed in you we thank you for that amen today's reading comes from luke 15 verses 11 to 32 Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, 
and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was, go what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Joe, for leading us in prayer and for reading the scriptures to us this morning. Really is much appreciated. And everyone else who's taken part in the, the services um, over the, the last while, it's so appreciated um, everyone who's given their time and effort to participate in that way. Um, a preschool teacher watched a three-year-old boy drawing something on the paper. She said, what are you drawing? And he said, I'm drawing a picture of God. Well, you can't do that, she said. Nobody knows what God looks like. And the little boy replied and said, well, they will now. <laughs> You know, it's an important question though. What does God look like? Or more importantly, what is God like? What is his nature? Well, the Bible tells us so much uh, about who God is and, and what he is like, that he is loving, that he is gracious. We're told in Psalm 145 verse 8, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. God is gracious. The message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is one of grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. That God has made a way for us to, to know him through the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth and the life. And in him, the image of the invisible God, we see who God is. 
God full of love, full of time for people, full of wisdom, full of righteousness, full of justice, full of grace. What an amazing God we serve. You know, many people have sought to define the word grace. Writers, artists, poets and lyricists have all tried to explore this beautiful concept. Bono, the lead singer of U2, penned the song Grace, seeking to communicate its beauty, its impact, and its transformative power. These are some of the lyrics of that song. Grace, she takes the blame, she covers the shame, removes the stain, it could be her name. It's a name for a girl, it's a thought that has changed the world. Grace changes people's lives. Grace is transformative and powerful. Um, and it's a wonderful, wonderful characteristic. You know, it's once said, when a person works an eight hour day and receives a fair day's pay for his time, that is a wage. When a person competes with an opponent and receives a trophy for his performance, that is a prize. When a person receives appropriate recognition for his long service or high achievements, that is an award. But when a person is not capable of earning a wage, can win no prize and deserves no award, yet receives such a gift anyway, that is a good picture of God's unmerited favour. This is what we mean when we talk about the grace of God. Undeserved favour. Grace is the gift that we do not merit. It comes free of charge with no strings attached. It can cost the giver everything and the recipient nothing. And we see this when Christ is on the cross, costing him everything. At that moment he is willing to lay down his life, forsaken by the Father, but giving so much so that we did not have to take that place, that he took our place, so that we could go free. Grace, unmerited favour, God's riches at Christ's expense. You know, at a conference many years ago, representing many Christians in England, a discussion was focused on the unique contribution that Christianity has made in the world. The debate went on for some time until C.S. Lewis walked into the room and he asked, what's this rumpus all about? On hearing what his colleagues were discussing regarding Christianity's unique contribution, he replied, oh, that's easy. It's grace. You know, grace is at the very heart of the gospel. C.S. Lewis was right when he said that grace is Christianity's unique contribution. All the other religions offer a way to earn God's approval. We see this in Buddhist's Eightfold Path, the Hindu doctrine of karma, the Jewish idea of a law-based covenant and the Muslim code of law. But God in Christ offers us reconciliation with the Father that does not have to be earned. In fact, it can be earned. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And perhaps the grace of God receives one of its finest expressions and explanations in the parable of the prodigal son. Some have called it the greatest short story in the world. It's a very simple story, but it's deceptively complex and it has a number of levels of meaning. And this morning I won't attempt to exhaust its meaning, but rather I want to reflect and draw out the nature of the Father's grace and love. There are three important characters in the story. There's the Father and there's two very different sons. The story has three parts. We have the story of the renegade son and the return of that son and then the reaction of the elder son. In all three sections, the father plays a crucial role. 
In fact, William Barclay suggests that this story might be better named the parable of the loving father. You know, we spoke last week about the rebellious son and I want to just touch upon that as well because to see his rebellion enables us to see the beauty of the grace shown by the father. So first of all, we see the rebellion of the prodigal son in verses 12 to 16. The character who begins the action is the younger son. He's a rebellious son. We're told in Luke 15 verse 12 that he asks for his share of the inheritance. In ancient culture, a very old man might divide his estate between his sons if he wanted to retire. Otherwise, the sons would receive his inheritance on his death. So the younger son demanding his inheritance while the father was still living was a tremendous sign of disrespect. It was an absolute slap in the face of his father. It was as if he was saying he wished his father was dead. And remarkably here, the father doesn't argue with the son. He doesn't argue with the son. He lets his son go after giving him his share of the inheritance but he has been deeply wronged deeply disrespected and deeply hurt the younger son had the Frank Sinatra syndrome I'll do it my way so we're told in verse 13 that he heads off to the far country the younger son dreamed of enjoying freedom away from his father and from his older brother He wanted his own way, so he rebels from the father. And he broke his father's heart. You know, think about how when we rebel from God the Father, we break God's heart. It breaks God's heart to see us go down the path of sin. To see us hurt and disrespect and fail ourselves and others and and God. But he's still there. And he's still waiting. We get a real insight into how God feels when people rebel against him and his love. His heart is broken as we look at this story. How must God feel when we rebel him against him? When we fail him? We break his heart. You know, the younger son's experience is that the grass is not always greener on the other side. Life in the far country was not what he expected. He he thought he would see the, the bright lights and it would all be wonderful and he would find life. But actually, he lost his life. His resources ran out. His friends left him. A famine came and he was forced to take a job feeding pigs, we're told in verses 13 to 16. He couldn't get any lower. He had rebelled. And the journey that he had taken had led to despondency, to despair, to heartbreak for the younger son. So as we see the rebellion of the lost son, it makes the grace of the father all the more beautiful we're told in verse 17 that the younger son had a light bulb moment we're told that he came to his senses he recognized he'd been a fool by wasting his inheritance by turning his back on his father he felt he had ruined forever his relationship with his father he didn't even feel worthy to have a relationship with his father he he was crawling back he was willing to crawl back and to be a servant. He realised he had messed up. He realised he had sinned and and hurt people whom he deeply loved. And we see described here in the story a repentant and a humble heart. The younger son realises, he comes to his senses that he's messed up. And he prepares that little speech to give to his father, begging his forgiveness, asking to be a hired servant. Look at verses 17 to 18 of chapter 15. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. 
I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. He was repentant. He was genuinely sorry for how he had rebelled, for how he had failed some of the people that he deeply loved. And it went beyond just feeling regret. It was genuine repentance because he followed in obedience. And we're told after in verse 20 that he got up and went to the Father. You know, if you're not a Christian today, I want to encourage you to humble yourself and turn from your sin. Repent of your sin and put your faith in Jesus Christ and you will be reconciled to God. He is the bridge between you and God, between you and our holy God. You know, there is a chasm caused by our sin that stops us having a relationship with our holy God. But Jesus has stood in the gap. He has taken the punishment that we deserve so that we could go free. And in knowing God and having a relationship with God, you can know life in all its fullness. Maybe today you are a prodigal, you are a child of God, but you've went off to the far country, you've rebelled, you've failed God, you've maybe failed others, you've been heading in the wrong direction. Can I say to you today, seriously with all my heart, it's never too late. It's never too late to come back, to come home to the Father. He's always there. He's always waiting, no matter what you've done, no matter how you've failed, no matter how long you've been going in the wrong direction. This is the powerful message of the gospel. Grace, unmerited favour. Grace transforms people's lives. I encourage you to humble yourself, to repent and to come home. So as the prodigal son humbly makes his way home with this rehearsed speech ready to give to the father, the story now shifts to the father. We're told in verse 20 that he sees his son a long way off. What a beautiful thought. It's almost as if he regularly is, is looking out the window or sitting at the front door or looking down the road wondering, is he coming home today? I wonder if he's going to come home. I hope he comes home. I hope my son comes back. He knows that if his son walks through the community until he arrives at the house, the son, when he sees him coming, that he'll be mocked, that he'll be ridiculed, that he'll be abused. So when the father sees his son coming as he's watching and sees him a long way off, he doesn't wait till he comes to the door to get that abuse and, oh, there's that son. There's what he's done. You know, he did this to his family. He did this to the father. He took his inheritance. They, he doesn't allow him to go through all that. He runs towards him. He runs towards him. He forgets his own dignity and runs to meet his son. Older men in that society did not run, but he runs. And he throws his arms around him and he kisses him. Both signs of total acceptance. We're told this in verse 20. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Isn't that so powerful? He just saw him coming from a long way off and he runs towards him. He wraps his arms around him and kisses him. He doesn't say, right, what have you got to say about yourself? He just shows grace and expresses amazing love. The prodigal son then gives his rehearsed speech of repentance and the father allows him to give his apology. But he doesn't let him go on to ask to be a hired servant. Rather, he interrupts his son to show him that he's been fully accepted. He sees the son. He hears his heart. And he accepts 
him back. The son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. This is speaking about, about sonship, about believing, uh, belonging to the family. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost in his fun. And so they began to celebrate. Wow. What an amazing response from the father. He's truly overjoyed that the son had returned. The son who had broke his heart. The son who had disrespected him. The son who had failed him. He doesn't just say, okay, come in, let's have a chat. Or, okay, you can come in and you can get a job working in the house. He reminds them that he is his son. And he puts the robe on him, he puts the, the ring on him, he throws a, a party, kills the, the fattened calf. It's just beyond anything that the son imagined. It wasn't earned, it wasn't deserved, but here we see the grace of the Father throwing a party. There's a, a celebration, there's outrageous generosity. God's grace is shown to us in Christ. God is outrageously generous in his grace to us in Christ. You know, this story tells us something of what God is like. You know, one of the main reasons that Jesus told this story is to say something about the nature of God. All of us have been in the shoes of the prodigal son. All of us at one point were enemies of God. All of us at one point were, were separated from God. But through faith in Christ, that we have received that embrace of the Father. And maybe at times in our lives as children of God we have strayed. And when we've come home, we've experienced the outrageous grace of our Father. He loves us so much. He's for you today. More than I could ever describe or imagine. You know, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. Through our faith in Jesus Christ. There's a story told about a man who commissioned um, a painting of the prodigal son. He went into work fervently. This man who took up the, the job to, to do the painting, um, labouring to produce a picture worthy of telling the story. Finally, the day came when the picture was complete and he unveiled the finished painting. The scene was set outside the father's house and showed the father with open arms ready to embrace his son. The man who commissioned the work was well pleased and was preparing to pay the painter for his work when he suddenly noticed a detail that the painter had missed. Standing out in the painting above everything else in the scene was the starkly apparent fact that the father was wearing one red shoe and one blue shoe. The man who was ready to pay for the painting was incredulous. How could this be? How could you make such an error? He asked the painter. And the man simply smiled and nodded, assuring the man, yes, this is what I meant to do. This is a beautiful representation of the love of God for his children. What do you mean? He asked the, the, the painter. Puzzled. Well the father in the picture. Was not interested in being colour coordinated. Or fashion conscious. When he went out to meet his son. In fact he was in such a hurry. To show his love to his son. That he simply reached and grabbed. The nearest two shoes that he could find. He is the God of the unmatched shoes the God of the unmatched shoes in such a hurry 
to embrace the son who was lost but is now walking up the path towards the home, coming home. And he just rushed, grabbed the nearest two shoes and rushed towards the son, the God of the unmatched shoes. Yes, the father in the story of the prodigal son indeed is like the God of the unmatched shoes. He hurries to reach out to his son that has returned. He hurries to forgive him, not with crossed arms of disapproval, but outstretched arms of love. The father hurries to reassure his son of the love that he has for him. The father hurries so that the son fully understands what is happening. He hurries so much that he puts on the two nearest shoes. He's not concerned about the colours matching. He is just concerned about his returning son. And our God through Jesus Christ is indeed the God of the unmatched shoes. The God of the unmatched shoes shows us very simply the love God through Christ has for us. He has shown his love to us in a hurried manner. For God could not wait one more minute to rescue us from our sins through the cross of Calvary. God wants to forgive our wayward ways and accept us into his loving arms as soon as possible. His love never fails. It never gives up on us. Unfailing love. His love endures forever. I wish I could describe the depth of the Father's love towards you today. I can only just share again this great story and point you to scriptures and ultimately point you to the cross and we'll share communion soon. And there we see the demonstration of the love of God for us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He loves you so much. I will always love you, he says to you. I will always love you. And just as we draw to a close, I want to tell another story just to illustrate something of the love of God the Father. It's a story I told at one of our online prayer gatherings a while back. And it's the story of a man, a young man called Sewat. And Sewat, basically, as he grew up, said to his father, I'm leaving, I'm going to Bangkok, I'm going to see, you know, the big city and I don't want to be involved in kind of family life and in the business. And so he headed away, he went to Bangkok, but before he had left, the father had said to him, son, I'll be waiting here for you. So see what arrived in Bangkok and he initially started out okay and was getting a few different menial jobs and earning a little bit of money and was kind of struck by the, the bright lights. But eventually he got into the wrong kind of groups and ultimately it led into him being involved in drugs and involved in prostitution and basically selling um, young girls to, to older men to use and abuse. And uh, he was in these gangs and had got right into the heart of all that was going on in, in these kind of situations in Bangkok. But eventually he got into a bit of trouble and um, he had to flee uh, because he was being accused of being a police spy and people were wanting to kill him. And things just got worse and worse for Sewa. And at his lowest ebb, when he was sleeping on the streets and um, he had lost all his money and um, he just saw no way forward, he was just full of regret and just thought about his lovely Christian father. And he thought to himself, should I go home? Could I go home? Surely he's disowned me by now. Word of what say what was up to and what he'd been involved in and got back to their their small rural, rural village and he just thought I don't think my dad would accept me I've messed up too much this time I'm abandoned, I'm rejected I'll be thrown out of the family they'll not want anything to do with me but he decided that what he would do is that he would write a letter to 
his father. And uh, what he would say to his father is that, Father, I'm making my way home. I'm going to come home. And um, if you accept me and are there for me, I want you to tie a little bit of white cloth on the poultry in our garden. The train would pass by uh, their house as it went into the station. And Sewat's idea was that if he saw the bit of cloth on the tree, he would know that he was welcome home and he would get off. If not, he would just continue and then head off somewhere else. So he wrote this letter and asked that his father would do this um, if Sewat was welcome home. And the letter went away and he had said that the day and the time that he would be um, coming on the train. And uh, the day came and he headed home. And he was on the train and as he neared um, his home village, he began to get really anxious, really upset. And he asked a, a man, he said, could you do something for me? He said, I I've let down my family, I've failed my family, I've disgraced my family, but I've written a letter to my father to say that if you um, welcome me home, please tie a bit of white cloth on that poultry in our garden. And he says, I can't look. Could you look for me? And and tell me if that bit of cloth is there. So they got closer to um, the, the town and the man was looking, the village, and the man looked out the window and to his amazement, he just saw the tree covered from top to bottom in little pieces of cloth. And the man was there. He was waving a bigger piece of cloth and running alongside at the train and he said to say well open your eyes look and he looked and he, he couldn't believe it he was crying his eyes out with joy that that his dad had done this he had covered the tree not just with one piece of cloth but with loads of pieces of cloth and there was his dad smiling and waving the the white piece of cloth and he got off the train at the station his dad had run along the line and was there waiting for him and embraced him he said i told you son i was waiting I was waiting for you. That's grace. Undeserved love and favour. That's family. God is so good to us. He's so loving. He's so gracious. He rejoices when sinners repent and turn to him. The word repent has within it the idea of, of turning or returning. In this case, returning home to re-establish a relationship with the Father. And I said it already, but I say it. Again, if you are not a Christian, humble yourself and repent of your sin. Turn from your sin and put your faith in Jesus Christ and you will be reconciled to God. But maybe you are a Christian. You are a believer. But you've been off in a far country. You've done it your way. Come home. The God of the unmatched shoes is waiting, ready to embrace you in his loving arms. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians 2 verse 8, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and not by your own doing. It is the gift of God. Salvation is unmerited favour. All we have to do is receive the gift from a God whose heart is bursting with love for us. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all that he has made. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. May we also be grace givers and show grace to those who maybe have failed us those who've maybe been in the far country, that we can be like God and seek to follow in his example because grace transforms people's lives. Let's pray. God, I just thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the power of your word. I thank you for the truth of your word. And Lord, I pray that you would soften all of our hearts to hear your word. It's so easy to harden our hearts. And Lord, I pray that you would give us soft hearts. Help us to be gentle. Help us to be kind. God, I thank you that every saint has a past and every sinner can have a future.
thank you, Jesus, that you are the image of the invisible God. And as we look at you, we see the grace that you showed to so many different people in so many different circumstances described in the gospel. And Lord, I pray that we would receive that grace, knowing that your grace is sufficient for us and that we would be grace givers, agents of your grace in a broken and a needy world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's respond to God's word by singing together and leading us into our time of communion. So we gather again around the Lord's table to remember the great sacrifice that Christ made for us on the cross. That indeed he is the image of the invisible God and that that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that Jesus was willing to humble himself even unto death on the cross. And I want to read some words just now as we come to eat bread and drink wine that just remind us of the supremacy of Christ. Colossians 1, uh, beginning at verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you have heard and has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. You know, God has made a way through Christ, for us to know him, to be reconciled to him. And as we look at the cross, we, we think about 
all that God has done. And we want to remember and we want to give God thanks. So let's join in prayer before we eat the bread and the wine. God, I just thank you so much that you sent your precious son. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift, the gift of Christ, the gift of salvation and forgiveness and reconciliation through his work on the cross. And Lord God, we just want to remember today and and reflect upon all that Christ went through. We think about the, the physical suffering. We think about the crown of thorns forced on his head. We think about the, the whippings and the, the lashings and the nails forced through his hands and his feet and the pain and the agony, the physical agony. But also we think about the fact that he was forsaken from the Father. That he truly took on himself all our punishment that was deserved for us. He shed his blood to pay the price for our sin. And we are just so thankful. Thanks be to God that he has made a way through Christ and through his death and resurrection that we can be forgiven and that we can know him. So as we think about the body of Christ given for us, we think about um, the, the bread that we'll eat tonight that represents that body given. And as we think about the blood shed for us for the cleansing, the forgiveness of our sins, we do so as we drink the cup that symbolizes that blood shed. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the night you would be betrayed, the Lord Jesus Christ took a loaf of bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Whenever you eat this, do so in remembrance of me. Eat the bread now and remember the body of Christ given for you. In the same way, after supper, the Lord Jesus took the cup and he said, This cup is a new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. Let's drink together as a sign of our unity in Christ. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, your death we remember, your resurrection we confess, your final coming we await. All the praise and glory be unto you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God again for a special time uh, together. Um, have a great day and we'll connect again soon. God bless.